Well, good evening, everybody. Glad you're here tonight. For our Wednesday night summer series, we're grateful that you're here. Get in out of the heat, sit where it's cool, listen to a good speaker and a, I guess a decent song leader. <laughs> um, got a great speaker with us here tonight, and uh, Philip will introduce him just a little bit later after we sing a couple of songs tonight, but I want to start us off with uh, the announcements we have. Anyone that's interested in signing up for Black Hills Bible Camp in South Dakota, you need to get with Chris Livingston. He's got a lot more details on that, and he needs to get you signed up so they know, you know how much to, room they have for packing and everything else. So get with Chris Livingston if you plan on going to Black Hills. That's coming up here real soon. Everyone is invited to VBS. That'll be this coming Sunday at 5 p.m. Our children are going to help lead us in the worship. VBS for ages 0 to 10 will continue until 8 p.m. Uh, the theme is Jesus is my friend this year. And uh, Chris has kind of sent out a notification to some people to kind of help out with that. There's going to be a, uh, like a celebration towards the end of it. There's going to be a bouncy house outside and all sorts of good fun things to do afterwards. So come, come at 5 on this coming Sunday night and uh, just enjoy some VBS time and uh, some study and also in the festivities afterwards. Grab a songbook there in front of you. Turn to number 438. Four thirty-eight. Need a couple songs here and then introduce our speaker. <clears throat> Four thirty-eight. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. sunlight all of my journey over the mountains through the deep air Jesus has said I'll never forsake thee promise divine that never can fail heavenly sunlight heavenly sunlight flooding my soul with glory divine I am re- 
Pressing my way to mansions above, singing his praises, gladly I'm walking, walking in sunlight, sunlight of love, heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Good evening. Good to see you guys tonight. I'm glad you're here in out of the heat. It's been a, a hot one this week and it continues to be, but I'm glad that we can be here together, especially to hear uh, someone that we don't get to hear from all the time. Uh, tonight, Steve Comer is with us. He is the campus minister of Razorbacks for Christ, which is sponsored by the Mount Comfort Church of Christ in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Uh, Steve is here with his wife, Lee. They were here last year and um, I told him I didn't remember exactly what the sermon was about. I, I kind of remember some things about it. And I, I remember that it was really, really good, though. So uh, you guys are in for a treat tonight, and uh, we're looking forward to Steve bringing the word. So I'll turn it over to him. Uh, thank you. You're too kind. To be fair, I don't remember what I preached last year either. So <laughs> it's okay. <clears throat> That's all right. Uh, in campus ministry, uh, there's a, a handful of things that I try and cover pretty consistently. I, I feel like I, I've got college students for four years or sometimes five or sometimes six years. And there's, there's a handful of things that I feel like, man, in that short amount of time, in this phase of life, they need to hear this. They need to study this. They need to know this about God. They need to understand this whatever about faith. Uh, and so there's, there's a bunch of topics that I, I make sure I work through every four to five years. And then there's littered in a whole bunch of kind of new studies. But I have a lot of material that I kind of reteach because I have you know, a new audience uh, every four years. Uh, but there's some things in our faith that I think we just need to remember. We need to be reminded of. And we need to just digest. And, and, and it kind of it feeds us. It, it pushes us forward uh, into the next week, into the next month. And it slowly grows our faith. And faith is not something that just, you know, boom, is developed. You don't just roll out of bed one day and be like, wow, man, I just, I'm just a whole new person. No, it's just these tiny little increments of growth in our life. Uh, and, and so I'm hoping that this is just one of those tiny moments of growth in your life. Because I, I want to just ponder a question that the world has been asking for quite some time. And it, and it seems to me, and maybe it's because of where I'm at on the university campus and things that I hear a lot of, but it seems to be a question that is just keeps coming up and keeps coming up. Uh, and the answer is not going to be some awesome revelation to you, but I think hopefully the, the answer is going to be piecing together some things and maybe just a little shift of a perspective on something awesome uh, that God has accomplished. Uh, but the question is, and you probably heard it from different sources, the question is basically this. How can an all-loving, all-powerful God condemn people to an eternity of punishment? How can that be resolved? Uh, and this becomes kind of an out for a lot of people. It becomes a reason not to believe. And it's kind of their... Their, their philosophy of, I have a picture of who God should be. And a God that is all-loving, or maybe the term omnibenevolent is familiar to you, a God that is all-loving would never do that to somebody if he has the power not to. And if he's omnipotent, all-powerful, then surely he does have the power to save all of humanity. So if he desires to save all of humanity, which he actually does, we see that in the Peters and the Timothys, we, God desires to save all of humanity, but he chooses not to, why is that? And, and for, for most people outside of the kingdom who are looking for a reason not to believe, that becomes a perfect scapegoat. Why would I serve a God who could save all people but chooses not to save all people and in turn condemn some to an eternity 
of punishment. Now, this whole question is littered with controversy, kind of every step of the way, there's controversy. And, you know, if we had a week, we could, like, work on each element of those controversies, but we only have 39 minutes. So in that time, we're going to have to work through those controversies uh, pretty quickly or maybe not at all. Uh, but I want you to just think about this, because this is not necessarily a question that just the world has. I think that a lot of Christians have these questions, but we're afraid to answer them, and we're afraid to ask them, uh, because we don't maybe know where the answers lead, or we don't have the best answers, and so we kind of avoid them. And maybe there's just those seeds of doubt. Even though, you know, you've been sitting in these pews for 40 years, there's still those seeds of doubt. And I don't want you to think that, that your faith is somehow in question or anything if you have seeds of doubt. I think all of us have seeds of doubt if we're honest. Maybe those seeds are different. Uh, but I, I don't want us to ever be afraid of addressing those seeds and looking into them and saying, maybe there's some things that I don't understand about God. <laughs> are we comfortable saying that? I th I'm comfortable saying that there's t many things that I don't understand about God. And sometimes part of the answer is, you know, there's just some things that I don't understand about God. And that doesn't mean that I've lost my faith. It means that there's still so much more about him that I have to learn. And I might not ever understand or learn. And that's okay also. And so I continue to pursue. Uh, all right, so how do we, so how do we solve this question? Now, do we serve a loving God? Uh, yes, we serve a loving God. I, I love 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Probably a familiar passage to you. But it defines God as love. It's, it's not that he has the characteristic of love or he has the capacity to love, but God is love. And so if you want to know the definition of love, you just look to God. Now, there would be a great study if we had the time to pause and say, let's hit the brakes for a second and figure out what love is. Because in, in kind of American culture, love is an emotion and a feeling that we have towards other people or even objects or dogs or food. But in the Bible, love is not an emotion and it's not a feeling. It's a commitment to honor somebody above yourself. And so just understanding that God is love, but outside of an American context is important. Understanding that God does what is best. All right. So, yeah. Uh, is God an all-loving God? Absolutely. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse 8. This is a passage that I turn to. Uh, in my own faith and in sometimes other people's faiths as I encourage them uh, because we lose this conviction that, that God actually does love us. And so here's what Paul says in not the context of answering this question but in a whole different context. But look at chapter 5 verse 8. He says, God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So God demonstrates his love. It's not just a declared love. It's a demonstrated love. And so you can look back and you can read passages like 1 John 4 and you can say, yes, God is love. He must love me. But then unequivocally, you can look at the cross and say, I know he loves me because he proved it. He demonstrated it. It's not just a, a verbal announcement. It's a demonstration. So yes, God does love. And in John 3... Verse 16, of course, God loves the world so much so that he would send his son. So we know that God loves. The second question I think that we kind of have to fizzle out is, is hell real? That's not a real popular question to be asking these days. It's not a popular topic. But interestingly, as, as we kind of move further away from talking about hell, the fact still remains that Jesus spoke about hell more than all the other New Testament writers combined. Jesus had no qualms talking about hell. And not that like, we need to, to beat it and, and hurt people with you know, guilt, but it's a reality. It's a truth that Jesus spoke about uh, quite often. Uh, when I think about uh, Jesus and talking about hell, I think about Matthew 25. And there's, again, lots of places that we could go to think about it. But Matthew 25 is this kind of parable, if you will, or image uh, of Jesus making the separation at the end of time of the sheep and the goats uh, on the day of judgment. 
Uh, and here's what Jesus says is uh, verse 33, talking about the king and this judgment. He will say to those on his right, Matthew 25, 33, say to those on his right, um, he will put the sheep on his right, excuse me, and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. And then he goes on to tell why. Because I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. And they're like, when did we see you in those conditions? And he says, when you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. Uh, and you remember that, that argument of Jesus saying, like you gave of yourself. You were a servant and it proved your love. And then in verse 41, the tides turn, right? And he says uh, to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels for I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. And he goes through the same logic for the folks that were not servants, did not give, did not share, did not help, did not love. And then the conclusion of both of those in verse 46. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Just one occasion that Jesus talks about the judgment and that there is life and punishment at the end. Right? And, that, that the, and Jesus just speaks about this as though these are just truths. This is just the way it is. He doesn't apologize for it. He doesn't sugarcoat it. He doesn't you know, play it down like, yeah, but you don't need to worry about it because God loves everybody. He just says, this is the way it is. And this is what's going to happen at the end of time. And so two things that we learn from that. Hell is quite evident to Jesus, quite real. And the second thing that we learn from this passage is that it's eternal. This is an eternal proclamation. Uh, in verse 41, he says to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire. All right? In verse 41, we see that this eternal fire was created for the devil and his angels. In verse 46... He calls it an eternal punishment. An eternal punishment. And just as much as this fire and this punishment are eternal, in verse 46, so is life eternal. Same words used to describe both the punishment and the life that is offered. So this isn't a, a temporary situation that some people just have to endure and go through. Any more than heaven is a temporary bliss that some people just go through. The punishment is eternal just as much as the life is eternal. Same words used that Jesus is trying to bring this to fruition. Trying to get our minds wrapped around it. There is an eternal punishment. And so some, some would try and compromise in this and try and find some ways through it so that God fits more of who we want him to be. He fits kind of this, this more loving God than this righteous God. Right? And so uh, we have things like, you know, hell doesn't really exist. It was just, you know, the Bible writers trying to convince us to, you know, to follow God. It was kind of used as a threat, but God's not really going to follow through with it. Uh, or maybe the, the kind of the, the doctrine of conditional immortality. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but it's the idea that, that when we die, those who were not righteous will just kind of cease to exist. While those who are righteous actually do live an immortal life. But only the righteous live for eternity while everybody else just kind of ceases to exist. Uh, and this kind of has uh, problems with the resurrection and our idea of, of us having an eternal part of us as a soul that God has, has created. Lots of different discussions there. Uh, but this is not something that Jesus ever addressed. He, he never talked about eternity like this. As though there's some people who are just going to cease to exist and don't need to worry about eternity while others live in the presence of God. In Matthew 25, he's painting a very different picture, an eternal picture. And I don't think Jesus would mislead us uh, in these ways. I think Jesus just speaks truth and that's the way it is. Uh, and it's not necessarily my goal to try and rationalize and justify God. He, he, he can do that all by himself just fine. And so we know that God loves us. Uh, we know that hell is real and we know that hell is eternal. And so we end up with this idea of 
does God actually send people there? And still in our section of Matthew 25, that seems to be exactly what's happening. He will say to those on his left, depart from me. Depart from me. And we're really going to find out that that's really the the depth, the, the worst part of hell is being separated from God for eternity. Completely missing out and being separated from his righteousness. You know, you might think that that the world is kind of a desperate place and there's a lot of evil in the world, but there's a lot of good in the world. And maybe it doesn't always balance out on any given Tuesday or Thursday, but there's plenty of righteousness in this world because of God's presence. And if you were to devoid the world of God's presence, what would be left? If you were to devoid the world of all goodness and all righteousness, what would be left? It would be a world without God. Right? So again, those are probably things that you know and have heard, but I, I would just resist the urge to try and wiggle out of them or try and make them into something they're not in order to make the question easier to answer. In, in a sense, what I'm trying to do is bolster the question. If the question is, how can an all-loving, omnipotent God Send people to an eternal hell. My goal so far has to been, that's a really good question. And my goal isn't to dismantle the question, it's to say, how do we answer that question? Because I think that's a very real, real question. And I think that's exactly what's going to happen at the end of time. And so how do we address that? And I want to address it by changing the way that we look at life and judgment. And and you probably do look at it this way sometimes, but the question itself is forcing you to look at life in the wrong way. It's forcing you to look at this whole scope of God, sin, and eternity from the wrong perspective. And that's why the world can try and paint us in a corner with it, Because they've shifted our perspective from reality and what really happens spiritually to this this way of looking at it, which makes God the perpetrator of evil. And if God is the perpetrator of evil, then, well, absolutely, why, why would we be serving a God such as that? And so I want to start off kind of looking at it in a different way from Romans chapter 7. So if you've got your scriptures with you, Get them open to Romans chapter 7. I want to take a look at how Paul views sin. All right? Romans chapter 7. And I know we're supposed to be going to Romans chapter 3 if we're going to see how Paul views sin. We'll get there. Don't you worry. And Romans 6, we'll get to that one too. Don't you worry. Romans 7 is intriguing to me. I just want to read a section from 7 to 12. Uh, Follow along. And Paul sometimes, you know, he, he doesn't just make the nice, easy sense in in our western way of thinking but try and follow his logic because there's some really powerful ideas in here that help us shift that philosophy of how we're looking at god verse seven what shall we say then is the law sin may it never be on the contrary i would not have come to know sin except through the law pause for a second paul says i would not have come to know sin if there was no law. All right? Still going on. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had said you shall not covet. But sin, taking the opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. So, so far, all he's saying is, I wouldn't know that I'm not supposed to covet unless God told me not to covet. And now that I know that, I understand that it's sin, and the law has produced that sin, because now I have a knowledge of that. Now, but look at verse 9. And I was once alive apart from the law. When was Paul alive apart from the law? And now Paul's a Jew, right? Well, not at this point, but you know, he's raised as a Jew. And so he was raised memorizing scripture who was raised in a Jewish environment with Jewish family from day one they were speaking to him the words of the Torah this would not have been something that you know they waited until the bar mitzvah and then they're like okay you should probably read this book it would be really important 
Man, by the time they're 13, they have huge chunks of the Torah memorized. Like the law was embedded in Paul's mind from a very early age. But he had just said, I wouldn't understand about coveting unless the law told me not to covet. And then he says, there was a time when I didn't know coveting was wrong. And I was alive. I was alive. Verse 9, but when the commandment came, sin became alive, and I died. Now, this is important for a lot of reasons, but the main thing that we want to get here is that there was a time in Paul's life before the commandment came, and it, and it made sense to him, and he became accountable to it, if we want to use those phrases, and he realized that that was sin, and it killed him spiritually kill him physically because he wouldn't be able to write this letter but he died spiritually but there was a time when Paul was alive and this is important to the whole argument because man does not come into the world dead in sin okay Paul could look back in a time of his life when he wasn't dead in sin when he was in fact alive before the commandment came to him and as a Jew he would have been hearing that all growing up and so there's some point in our lives when we're alive before sin enters the picture. Right? And Paul talks about that at some time in his life. In verse 10 he goes on, this commandment which was to result in life proved to result in death for me. For sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So then, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Uh, therefore, that which is good became a cause of death for me. All right? So try and keep this all in mind as we're building through this pattern of when did Paul become go from alive to dead? It was when the commandment came into his life. There was a time that Paul was not, you know, spiritually speaking, separated from God. He wasn't dead. Now jump to chapter 5. All right. Uh, now we're moving backwards in the letter. It'd be nice if we had time to just move straight through the letter. Obviously we don't. But look at chapter 5, verse 12. As he's talking about God's response to sin in the previous verses, he brings it together in verse 12. And he says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, all right? so he's talking about Adam, right? Adam's sin, and so sin enters the world through him, and then death comes because of that. So death spreads to all men because all have sinned. And so the consequences of sin is death. Death doesn't spread to all men because Adam sinned. He says death spreads to all men because they have sinned. And Paul says there was a time in my life before that happened, and I was alive. But then sin came, and I died. All right? And this might not, maybe you're not seeing how we're going to make this connection, but this is all part, this is a really important connection to make. That's why we're, we're kind of hounding this. And obviously this death that we're talking about is not a physical death. We've all sinned, and yet here we are physically still here alive. We're talking about a spiritual death where we're disconnected from God. We're separated from God. Death is just a separation. All right? As, as Paul says at the end of Romans chapter, or I'm sorry, James chapter 2, when he's talking about faith and works in James chapter 2, and he says, just as the body is dead without the spirit, so faith without works is dead. It's just a death is just a separation. If you separate faith and works, well, your faith dies. If you say, separate your body and your spirit, your body dies. Right? Your, your spirit, the spirit that God breathes in us is what is making you alive right now, which is animating you. It separates you from these pews and these beams. Uh, they don't have the, the spirit in them. Like they're, they're just inanimate objects. And so when we die, this death that we're talking about, we were united with God and now we've been separated from God because of sin. And so what is God's response to sin? Keep going backwards, back to Romans chapter 3. 
This is probably my favorite section in the New Testament, Romans chapter 3. Uh, so as we go through, I want to point out a handful of things. Uh, but first of all, at, we're going to read it, and I want you to count how many times he brings up God's righteousness. Uh, as we go through, you're, you're listening and counting at the same time. I trust you can do that. It's, here we go, verse 21. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. How many times did we talk about God's righteousness? Four times, that's right, four times. Five if you count just in there. Just and righteous are pretty close, but four, five if we're flexible on it. All right? Now, in 21 through 26, in five verses, if Paul talks about the righteousness of God four times in five verses, do you think that that's an important theme of this section? All right? Sometimes, if you ever, you know, you're just kind of sitting around on a Thursday afternoon, you don't have anything to do, uh, find key words in books. And you can go online and you can find websites that will tell you these things. Or you can just, you know, do the grunt work yourself and start looking up words on a concordance and how many times. But if you find words in a book, Romans or Corinthians or something, that appear a whole bunch, you quickly start to see themes of the book. Like one of the key words in, in Matthew is kingdom. You just see the word kingdom all over the place. Way more than you see it in Mark or Luke or John. And so right off the bat, without even really diving into Matthew, you just know that Matthew wants to teach you something about the kingdom of God. And, and that needs to be kind of rolling in your mind all over the place. Right? And so when you look at a whole book, you can do that. But sometimes you look at a section and when you start reading through a section, you're like, man, why does he keep using this word? He's trying to tell us something. And this section is about a lot of things, but primarily it's about the righteousness of God. And in case we haven't made that point yet, that's what this whole evening is about. Is the righteousness of God is in question. Is God a righteous God? Can he be an all-loving, all-powerful God who condemns some to an eternity in punishment and yet be righteous? That's really the question when it boils down to it. And Paul is just saying, yes, in a big giant banner with flashing lights on it, yes. And here is how. Number one, he says this is going to happen apart from the law in verse 21. It's not going to happen through the law of Moses. This is going to happen apart from the law of Moses. And we are going to see God's righteousness come out. It didn't come through the law of Moses. God's true righteousness was manifested in Jesus. And now he reminds us in verse 23, all of this was to solve this sin problem that we have because we've all fallen short of God's glory. But verse 24, how is God going to handle this? Number one, we're going to be justified as a gift. The word justified means to be made righteous. Now again, this is going to play into the whole theme of how God maintains his righteousness through all of this. We are made righteous. God never asks you to be righteous on your own accord because you can't. It's not possible. And so the only way that you could ever be possibly righteous enough for God is if he takes care of that for you. You, you can't do it. You'll never be righteous enough to get to heaven. Never. The only way you get there is if God justifies you. Right? He makes you Right. That's what it means to be justified. Like, have you ever, you ever done something stupid or said something stupid? And, and uh, you know, you have to kind of 
try and justify yourself. Like, well, I didn't, you know, when I said that, obviously this is what I meant. And we kind of backtrack, you know, and we try and justify ourselves and whatever we did or said, because we know it was wrong. We know what we did was wrong. And so we're trying to make it right. right? Well, that's what God is doing. He's like, you guys, you guys have messed up all over the place, but I am going to make you perfect as a gift. It's a beautiful, beautiful doctrine. Uh, secondly, he says that we're justified as a gift by his grace through, and this is how he's going to justify us, through redemption. All right, there's probably not a word that you use every day, but redemption is the idea of being bought back. Right? To redeem something is to buy it back. Like, <clears throat> in my day, you know, back when I was a kid, like, when I, we'd run around the neighborhood, right, and we would gather aluminum cans. Anybody else, like, ride their bike around neighborhoods and gather aluminum cans to recycle? I don't know, maybe it's just my neighborhood. But at the grocery store, we had this huge container that was a big machine that was called the Redemption Center, right? And we would take our cans that we collected from the garbage cans and out in the fields and, you know, in the gutters, and we would clean up the neighborhood of aluminum cans, and we'd dump them in this little thing in the Redemption Center, and it would start crunching, crunching, crunch, 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 and a quarter would spit out, right? And we'd be like, oh yeah, grab the other garbage bag. And we would, we would do that all the time. And for some reason, somewhere, somebody wanted to buy that stuff back. They wanted to redeem those cans. It was garbage to us. We were happy to get money for it. Somebody saw value where there was no value. Somebody wanted that trash because they wanted to do something awesome with it. And so God redeems us. We've chosen sin and selfishness. And God wants so desperately to turn us into something awesome. And so he buys us back through Jesus. The price that is paid is Jesus, and he redeems us. He gives the valueless amazing value and turns it into something amazing. Then this all happens, verse 25, because God displayed Jesus publicly. The New American Standard says, as a propitiation. And you'll see that a couple times in the New American Standard. Most Bibles are like, well, let's, uh, let's change that. Up. Nobody knows what the word propitiation means anymore. And I don't either until, you know, I look it up because it's a Bible word. It's not a normal word. But it's basically the idea of a substitution. There's lots of layers and depth to this word. But at the surface level, it's a substitution, right? And it's basically the Old Testament sacrificial system in a word, right? Well, I, you know, I, I killed my friend's ox. And so, you know, I should have to pay the penalty for it. But I, so I'm going to go to the temple and I'm going to offer a sin sacrifice, uh, so that I don't have to pay the penalty for that sin, this animal will pay the penalty for that sin. Uh, so it was a substitution. Instead of, you know, this Jew dying for their sin, God allowed them to offer an animal to die in their stead. And obviously the illustration is that Jesus is our propitiation. He's the one that took our place when we should have paid that penalty for our sin. We should be paying the penalty of death for our sin. And so Paul says, this is so important, at the middle of verse 25, this was to demonstrate his righteousness. To demonstrate that God is righteous. Wouldn't it have been simple for God to just say, you know what, sin is a mess, and it's messing up all these people, they're broken, let's just forget about sin. Let's just not worry about sin, let's just call it a draw, and everybody, he can't do that and be righteous. You can't ignore problems and be righteous. And so instead of just sweeping it under the rug, instead of just ignoring it, God says, I am going to do the best possible to take care of this sin problem. The absolute most that I could possibly do, I am going to step into creation I'm going to live among them and draw them out of sin and give them a path to holiness. Find another religion where God even remotely cares about his people enough to do that. You look at most world religions and it's like, well, good luck. You know? And if you don't make it this time, don't worry, you'll die and I'll give you another chance. You'll, 
be reborn and you'll try again and you'll try again. For a thousand years, you'll keep trying. But the one true living God says no. You'll never do it. No matter how many times, how many lives that you have, you'll never do it. I will do it for you and pull you out of it. All, right. All of that was like the gospel in a nutshell, right? But hopefully we're painting it in a different way. Because the question says, how could God send people to hell? And I want you to think about it from this perspective of, we chose that path. We chose the path of selfishness. We chose the path of sin and death. And God has gone over and above to try and rescue us from that path. Think about it this way, maybe as an illustration, I don't know if it'll make sense to you or not, but imagine you're on a train, right? And this train is bound for a brick wall. It is barreling headlong into a brick wall. And you know that, right? Maybe you knew it before you got on the train. Maybe you got on the train knowing that. I don't know. It doesn't matter. But now you're on the train and you know it. It's like, next stop, brick wall, we all die. Like, like nobody's hiding it from you. There it is. And you're barreling at 100 miles an hour and you don't know where the brick wall is. This train could go for a day. It could go for 10 years. You don't know. But you do know that this train wrecks into a wall and we all die. Now, there happens to be one of those little, those little ring you know, little things that you can pull at any time. And you can get off this train. You can just pull it, the train will stop, you can step off, and off it goes without you. Right? Anytime you have the ability to stop the train and get off. But you don't. You ride that train to the brick wall and you die, just like everybody else on the train. Whose fault is it? Who is responsible for your death? Is it the conductor's fault? Or is it your fault? See, this is the whole perspective of the question. The world wants to say it's the conductor's fault, the train is you know, running into the brick wall and it should, that train could have been stopped. But I want you to look at it from a different perspective that says there are immutable laws of righteousness that cannot stop the train. But you can get off that train anytime, anytime you want. You can get off. The victim mentality says, it's not my responsibility, it's not my fault. God is saying, you have chosen a path of death. Please, please get off of the train. Please come into paradise. Come into eternity. I can save you from the train. You just have to want it. It doesn't seem so complicated, does it? It's not an unrighteous God who is condemning people to hell. It is absolutely a righteous God who is trying with everything in his power to give us a way out of hell calling us out of it repeatedly, trying to pull us off that path. But there's one thing that stops him. Choice. God has given you the choice to ride that train as long as you want. And you can ride it to the end if you want. God will not force you to come after him. God will not force you to get off the train. He will not force you to follow him. Because love... They can't do that. They can't do that. Have you ever had, maybe this is more for the ladies, have you, have you ever had a guy that just, you know, he, he likes you and maybe he, he won't, you know, he asks you, but, you know, and you're like, no, and you try and turn him down politely and then he keeps asking you again. You're like, no, no, please leave me alone. And he just keeps asking and keeps asking. Then he shows up at your work with flowers and you're like, okay, this is getting really weird. And he starts to, have you ever had somebody that, you know, goes from kind of flattering to stalker, <laughs> right? You know, maybe some of the guys have too, you know, I don't know, but mostly we, we tend to be the guys that are going overboard. And at some point along that path, you start thinking, this is, this is not healthy. This is not right. And this guy has too much of an affection for me that I don't want. And you, you don't want him in your life. As much as he wants to be in your life, you don't want him in your life. And you try and make that abundantly clear. God is the guy who's pleading, please come. But he's not going to force you. He's not going to force himself upon you. 
He's not going to override your will or your desires to make that happen. But he offers freely the gift to get off the train and to walk into life. That's the difference in how we perceive the question. It's not God condemning us as though he's unrighteous and arbitrarily choosing. He is seeking so badly to pull us off the path that we have chosen to be on. Sparing us from our decision of eternal punishment. Thank you for your time. Steve, I want to thank you for coming all the way from Northwest Arkansas and again blessing us with this message. Uh, very important and uh, well put and we thank you and Lee for coming our way once again. It's been a real blessing. I want to thank you all for being here too this evening. We're going to close now in a word of prayer and please stay around afterwards for some fellowship. If you don't know Steve and Lee, please get to, get to know them while they have some time with us here. Let's bow in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for your love, Father, for your watch care over us. We're a thankful people, thankful for our lives and for your love and for the many blessings that you've seen fit to bestow upon us. Father, we know that the greatest blessing of all is your Son and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who came to this earth as a perfect example of service and of sacrifice to save us, Father so that we might have a chance for eternal life with you. Father, we ask that as we consider these things that we heard tonight, Father, as we consider our lives, that we'll use them to be better ambassadors for you, be better people, Father, in our communities, in our schools, in our workplaces, and with one another, Father, as Christian brothers and sisters. Go with us this night, the rest of this week, and all of our days, so that we live so that Christ's light shines in us. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.